um, is to me so much of the story of the contributions of women in the movement. Um, their uh, presence is felt and the impact of their work is what we are the benefactors of. But we often don't know their names and the genius and strategy of their work often goes unacknowledged, um, at least by people who weren't directly and authentically connected to them. Um, and so I just wanted to share that <laughs> honor to a couple of the women of the civil rights movement that I feel connected to and the women of FST that I feel um, connected to and, and make them more public for others. I can also think about Charlene, Aunt Charlene, who's not here, who I think was a tremendous force in the Free Southern Theater, and I hope that we'll get to hear more about her work even in her absence. Um, and finally, before I give it to y'all, I just wanted to say that oftentimes the presence of women does not necessarily mean um, the notice of the impact, not only of our work, but uh, the ways that racism or white supremacy or oppression impact black women. Um, you know, like we often think about the uh, consequences of carrying through with the commitment to challenge white supremacy uh, that happened in the movement and then uh, the fruit of the movement, like FST, um, as things, consequences of what happened to black men. But there are consequences and benefits that are specifically rooted in the ways of being of women. And uh, that I would like to just remember and acknowledge and notice. So just thank you all. because I was in SNCC. Um, I started working with SNCC when I was a sophomore in college in Atlanta. Um, I went to my dream college, which was Selma. Um, but it didn't turn out to be such a dream. <laughs> Um, Stolen was really a good school. Um, I grew up very poor and I wasn't used to um, being treated like I was poor because I didn't think I knew I was poor when I went to school. Um, but they let me know. Um, but I became involved with SNCC then and I think mainly because I had some very good history, there were some good people at Stolen. And um, I was told about SNCC and so a number of us started working with the sit-ins, and we got arrested, of course, and we were very proud of that. Except I was on scholarship, and so I was told to either stop my work with um, the civil rights movement, or I could, you know, would be um, moved out of school. So I decided to leave, and I worked full-time with SNCC. Um, 
<laughs> I worked full time in state for a few years, went to New York to finish my education. And because I knew John and he knew I was a starving student who needed work, I started working in um, the um, SNCC, um, I mean the FST fundraising office, which was a great experience, I have to say. Thank you. So if everybody will just do an introduction, that'd be great, and then we'll get to the question. Okay. Dr. Doris Derby, uh, I started, um, I was started in the uh, civil rights movement back when I was 16, I joined the NAACP from New York, and um, my father faced discrimination in, uh, on his job, and so I'd say that he was a civil rights worker too. And, for discrimination in the civil service as a New York State employee. He and um, two or three others founded an organization to combat discrimination uh, in the New York State Employee Service, and they got Constance Baker Motley, a well-known attorney, to take their case, and the only years they did win their case. So I had that example, and I had the example of my elder, my grandparents, out um, and be around your elders there'll be things that you know that help you uh, discover your path and there'll be things that you don't know but that's in the spirit of the of their presence um, and that will help you move on I discovered that my grandmother on my mother's side and her oldest brother were charter members of the NAACP in the 1920s in Bangor Maine and I didn't know that, but somehow or other the, the spirit because I don't think that she knew, but it came through us at any rate. So I was uh, a part of students at Hunter College, um, 1960, who uh, reacted to what was happening with the demonstrations, uh, sit-ins, etc. And we a group of us decided to go to North Carolina and talk to students who were involved in organizing SNCC. Uh, and then I went to Albany, Georgia in 1962 in the summer after I graduated from college and I was teaching. And I went there just for a week and ended up staying for the rest of the summer because I got involved. Uh, after that, they asked me to uh, raise money, books, clothing, canned goods for Albany, Georgia movement. I had Bob Moses come to uh, be the keynote speaker for the fundraiser, and he said, you need to come to Mississippi to work in our adult literacy project, which we're starting. I told him, uh, no way, <laughs> I'm not going. And a month later, I said I would go after I saw uh, the demonstrations, how the police were reacting uh, with fire hoses, uh, billy clubs, dogs, etc. And I said, if the people there can do that, the least I can do is go to Mississippi for a year and work in the literacy project. So then the rest is history. Um, that's where we, John and I, met um, early on uh, in Mississippi and Gilbert, and that's when we started talking about the Free Southern Theater. I'm Corvatus Jack Bro, and I'm here because I was one of the early New Orleans members of FST. And I always kind of qualify that by saying I was a part of the writing arm of the FST, which later became known as Black Art South. And in the early days, I was very much mentored by Tom Dent. And my point of entry is very different. I was a very sheltered Catholic all-girl high school kid <laughs> who was pulled into FST by an upperclassman who had uh, read my work in our school newspaper and said, you've got to come to this workshop. This is something you have to do. 
And I'm awfully glad she did that. And it literally influenced my life and the voice of my work. And I'm a poet. I did not march. I did not sit in, but was a part of the cultural arts movement. I guess I'm the only one sitting up here who is not or was not a part of FSC. My name is Dorotha Smith Simmons. Everybody knows me as Dodie, and back in the 60s, I was Dodie Smith. How did I become involved with FST? Well, at the age of 15, my sister say 16, but I was a couple of weeks from 16, so I was 15, when I became a member of the NAACP Youth Council, not because I wanted to, uh, because I was interested in civil rights. I wanted to go out dancing. <laughs> and that's what my sister Dorothy was amongst the black students that re-desegregated LSUNO. And from that group of students, they formed the NAACP Youth Council. One night I er overheard a conversation my sister was talking to one of the NAACP U Council members, and they were talking about they were going to the Golden Pheasant. And I said, mm-hmm. Mama told her, when the meeting is over, come straight home. So I blackmailed my sister. I told her if she didn't take me to the NAACP meeting, pay my dues and pay my bus fare, I was going to tell Mama. <laughs> and she did. And we went to the Golden Feathers, and after, for 25 cents, we got six tunes on the record, on the jukebox, and danced the night away. Mama say, why y'all coming home late? Oh, we missed the bus, or the bus was late. <laughs> <laughs> so later, uh, while I was still a member of the NAACP Youth Council, Jerome Smith, who was here earlier today, and Rudy Lombard, who was the chairman of New Orleans Corps, came to one of the NAACP Youth Council meeting and asked us to help them in their sit-in and boycott of Woolworths and Macquarie's on Canal Street. So we did. After a couple of weeks of sitting in and picketing with Corps, one of the senior adult members of the NAACP came to our meeting and said, if you go to jail, we will not get you out. So not being one to be told what I can and can't do, myself along with several other members, all females, got up and walked out of the NAACP Youth Council meeting and joined New Orleans Corps, and we became the backbone of Corps. And I'll tell you later, how I became really involved with Free Southern Theater. Hello everyone, I am Frozine Thomas. I am a mother, a grandmother, and a great, pr proudly great grandmother. I, everything I've ever done in my life is because of my children. They've been my battery, my source of energy and everything that I hold dear. I got involved with FST because I'm radical. That's just a fact of life. Everybody know me know I'm radical. I'm unusual. I'm unique. And they needed some of that. So I figured I'd come in and lighten up the place for them, give them some, some joy along with everything else they had going on. Now really, I, I, I joined the FST in 1973. And I joined because I was a confused, radical, politically radical person who wanted to know more about uh, my feelings politically. You know, I, I was all over the place. I didn't have any, any sense of direction for my, for my political understandings. And I knew that in New Orleans, FST was known to have 
um, very good um, resources for 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 guiding misguided uh, politician type people, <laughs> and that's what I considered myself at the time. Now I'm just a little old lady, and uh, loving it. Still radical though. Oh, the, oh, please, child, I will be a radical in the grave. <laughs> yes, I will. But anyway, I joined the FST in 1973, enjoyed it very much, um, became a member, became one of the workers of the FST. I worked in the office, couldn't spell a lick, but I worked in the office. And I answered telephones and stuff like that. Then I, be, I joined the Actors Workshop. The Actors Workshop is where I learned and honed my chops, my skills for the stage, film, or whatever. I am good at it, trust me. But I, I became good at it because I had good people guiding me. I had John O'Neill, I had Chakula Chajua, I had Ben Spillman, and many other fine uh, teachers of the art of theater. I got very good at it, and I became sort of like a little lightweight, you know, star of the FST. Plus, I learned how to paint, I learned how to make costumes, makeup, I could do hair, or whatever else was required. As a matter of fact, I starred in productions and had to go in the back and get the paint off of me before I went on stage. That's how much work you learn to do. You learn to do it all, and that's, that makes you a very appreciative and well-rounded performer. When you know how hard everyone else worked to, to make a production a production, you know, it makes you, it makes you uh, more conscious of, of what you're supposed to do. But the, but the most important thing is it gives you the impetus to make sure that you put across the message that the writer of whatever production you're doing, you are, are, are feel compelled to put forth that writer's message. And that's what I learned about acting as a member of the Free Southern Theater. But in terms of my politic, I learned the same thing, that everything is political. And it is important that you take a political stance in this life. You know, some people want to say, oh, well, I don't do this politic thing. Everything you do is political. When you buy a loaf of bread, you are taking a political stance because you're choosing one brand over another. And thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. So doing the introduction. Here is Bertha. If you'll introduce yourself, then we'll split time. Five minutes each. So we get a half hour together. And then they'll have a half hour. I'll pose questions after you speak. And we'll talk about that right when we get to it. Okay. Okay. I'm Bertha O'Neill and um, I worked for the Free Southern Theater between uh, 1969 and 1971. So I didn't have a long history with the theater, but uh, for me it was, a, it was a crucial time in my life because it was my very first real job, you know, besides babysitting neighborhood children and that sort of thing. And I worked as a um, secretary. <laughs> so. Um, I wasn't exactly an artist. Um, when I started the Free Southern Theater, um, it was sort of a, um, 
a trial by fire <laughs> because um, they were involved in things that I had not been exposed to. Um, so when I came there, uh, first of all, I didn't like get a lot of direction. They said, okay, these are the things you need to do and people kind of went away. And okay, you need to get these file cabinets together and all of that. And so being somebody who has always liked to read, I read a lot and I learned a lot about the Free Southern <laughs> Theater uh, because everything I filed, I read it first. <laughs> and so um, I learned a lot that way, and uh, I also learned a lot from the people who actually worked there. Uh, there was a, well, at that time, there were a lot of people from New York, so I guess I came kind of at the tail end of, of that crew, and um, a lot of these uh, revolutionaries who had their ideas about how black people should be, and, you know, and were quick to inform me when I was not exactly that way. <laughs> And so, um, but it was a learning experience, you know. I didn't always accept my lessons well, and sometimes, you know, I kind of resisted and fought, but, and, and some I never accepted. But anyway, um, I think that it was an important time for uh, the city the city of New Orleans, because I think it was sort of new at that time to the city, and there were a lot of people who were involved, and a lot of people uh, who might have been doing, some people that I knew from, you know, my childhood or whatever that I saw, who, who might have been doing something else had they not been doing that, um, and as well as, you know, well, I might have been doing something else that was maybe less useful. Um, I also came to kind of uh, feel, I think I kind of grew some more self-esteem because I felt like I was like young and inexperienced and didn't know a lot of stuff and so didn't feel equal to the task and just being involved in it. And um, like Frozine say, you know, this was a small organization. So you end up doing a lot of things that you might not do in some other kind of organization, including I did just a teeny bit of acting, <laughs> uh, thanks to Tom Dent's insistence. Uh, it was not me, but you know, it was a good experience, and so. Um, Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, that's everybody. Everybody, this is us. <laughs> so um, we came up with some some prompt questions, but much like in a story circle, you should really say what's most important to say, um, even if that's not an answer to the prompt question. They're really literally prompts. So hopefully they've helped you to think about stories or things that are important to you. So I'm gonna read all three of the questions and then I'm going to ask um, Dr. Derby if you would go first. And then we'll go to your left and back down here. Because um, it makes sense to start at the beginning. And um, so I'm going to read the questions. And then I'm going to do something that's a little obnoxious that I learned from the story circle process, which is to, to put the timer on from the phone. So you'll hear a song when it's time, when you're, when you're at, Mama Doty said, you got five minutes, so I'm gonna time you at four minutes, so you get a minute to wrap up your thought. Um, okay, okay, so here are the, um, and we're doing that just so that we can share time equally. The first prompt is, when you say Free Southern Theater, what's the story that comes to your mind? The second is, What's the story of where you felt most changed or most challenged during your work with the Free Southern Theater? Or when did you feel the most scared or the most loved during your time with the Free Southern Theater? Um, Dr. Derby? <laughs> well, you can answer one okay. or all or something else. Give me the first question again, please. 
When you say Free Southern Theater, what's the story that comes to your mind? Well, I guess the the uh, coming together, the the process of coming together with uh, John and Gilbert Moses, uh, and talking back and forth, deliberating about what we thought uh, was missing there, um, and and how uh, what could we do with given with um, uh, our background, our interest in the arts and theater. Um, being a part of civil rights, what could we do to establish some kind of change? Um, what tools did we have? Who would we work with? Um, how could we establish something that would make a difference, that would help in um, making uh, democracy a reality more so for um, the people that we were interacting with as a part of the civil rights movement. The challenge was how were we going to do it? Where were we going to get the resources? How were we going to draw upon the skills and talents that we had within us and within the people that were around us? How would we just uh, what, what were the, the baby steps we had to take? Um, what would our roles be? Uh, I know I had my vision of what my role was, uh, or roles would be, and someone mentioned how you only, you, some people want you to walk one line. I was already walking several lines, and I wasn't going backwards. So um, I walked the lines that were basic to me and my upbringing. And it wasn't about doing um, things that somebody else thought I should do. It was about being true to my spirit and my skills and talents. And so that's what I thought I, I would bring to whatever we were trying to accomplish. And um, I was flexible. But I had a lot of skills. I was already a teacher. And I pretty much um, had my own vision. And, and to, a certain, to a certain extent, our visions overlapped. And, and that's where we uh, came together to decide this is what we're going to do. But there were a lot of challenges. And um, we, we had to look within ourselves, and to the extent that we looked within ourselves and the people around us, we were able to accomplish more, I felt, as opposed to looking way outside of us to areas that were foreign to us, but thinking that there was a rainbow uh, somewhere else. Next question. We still have time. What's the other want. question? Uh, when did you feel the most scared or the most loved during your time with the Free Summer Theater? Well, of course, the, the scared part was all the other things that were going on um, with the Civil Rights Movement, which the Free Southern Theater was, um, just was a part of that. And we, John and I were both working with SNCC and Gilbert, too. So the scary part was you didn't know what was going to happen if you were um, driving from Tougaloo to Jackson. We were still working with SNCC in COFO, Council of Federated Organizations, as field secretaries, going out, um, doing voter registration, uh, participating in day-to-day -day activities, meeting other SNCC folk, and being involved in um, what SNCC was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We didn't know when some of our friends might come back uh, after being chased in the car. Uh, if you rode in an integrated car, you had to be careful. You didn't know when the police might come, uh, if you were going back and forth to Jackson or whatever you were going to be involved in. So the, the bigger picture was the scary part. But you knew that you were committed to doing what you needed to do, and that while it loomed out there, um, that threat, 
you still were going to do what you needed to do. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought that music was going to be Oh, I didn't need that was the music? Mm -hmm. May I read? I, I did uh, prepare something when I put a panel together for the Furious Flower Conference on the Black Arts Movement in the Deep South. And so they're brief comments. I don't know that it will be inside of five minutes, but I think it's important to talk about points of entry. And so this is a personal recollection of the black arts movement in New Orleans. During the black arts movement, commonly known as BAM, of the 60s and 70s, when the most recognized and lauded cultural activity was in New York, a less recognized faction of the movement was thriving in the Deep South and in New Orleans in particular, home to many writers and aspiring writers, of which I was one. Interest in community theater was on the rise. The Free Southern Theater had an office here in 1968 and regularly staged written pieces by black playwrights. And they staged these productions in the heart of the city's impoverished and deteriorating neighborhoods, the Lower Ninth Ward and the Central City. FST conducted writing and acting workshops that resulted in a calendar of live performances. In 1968, I wrote for my high school newspaper, which also published my poetry. An upperclassman, after reading my work, insisted that I attend a community workshop with her. We traveled to a former storefront on Louisa Street down in the Ninth Ward. Up to that time, my work was a reflective, meditative, almost prayerful, inward-turned examination of self. Place and circumstance came through the workshop process. Concern and anger that grew from struggle for civil rights and human dignity and the continued lack of opportunities for black people fueled much of the writing of our literature. It took time and an almost immediate change of mindset for me to adjust to the level of discussion, as well as how message focused everything that past workshop grade was. I had not marched in any protest or sat in any sit-ins. My understanding of the civil rights movement was adolescent and academic. My ability to participate in the burgeoning black power movement was limited and unlikely. I was a teenager who attended a recently integrated all-girls Catholic high school. Many of the FST workshop participants were political activists who belonged to groups whose work involved intense and sometimes dangerous community organizing. Workshop poetry topics centered on issues of economic depravity, racial oppression, police brutality, neglected or abandoned children and families, and spousal responsibilities. There was also also an abundance of love poetry. Work that survived the grueling workshop process was often read to live audiences. Knowing that the work had to be performance ready heightened our interest in using rhythmic forms that matched the message, engaged audiences, and provoked thought. The pinnacle of success was a piece that actually spurred action. Irreverence was the cultural revolutionary's nectar. We had little, if any, regard for established forms, no interest in reading or imitating Shakespeare or any other icon of Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-American literature. We believed with a quiet certainty that we were forever changing American writing. We embarked on our journey with the gusto of fully patron-supported explorers sailing into new worlds, although we paid our own tabs. We reappropriated language, taking it back for the people, average people, who were excluded from most literary dialogues, people who needed life-affirming and possibly life-changing bulletins, manna in an increasingly hostile world, forced to pry open its locked doors of, in closets of oppression. In the vernacular of the street, often with accompanying profanity, 
real life stories were rendered in tongues that needed no unraveling for clarity. Use of the communal voice was common, accepted, and expected. Preachy by choice, we had an unabashedly clear and unapologetic sense of audience. We wrote for and about black people, all people of the African diaspora, wherever they might be. When I hear the word FST, what comes to mind is in 1963, sitting in the Southern Regional Office of the Congress of Racial Equality Corps, three young movement type people walking into my office. They were down the hall at the law firm of Colin Douglas and Eli visiting. These three people were John O'Neill, Yo Moses, and Denise Nicholas. They came in, introduced themselves, and at that time, I didn't know anything about theater. I'd never been to a live performance in my life, even though it was always my intention to be the next Dirty Dandridge. <laughs> until FST came to town the following year in 64. And I went to, when they were doing the production of Pearl of Victorious at St. John Institution of Baptist Church on Jackson Avenue, right around the corner from the Southern Region Office of Corps. I would go after work and was intrigued by Richard Schechner and John O'Neill. John always often forgotten his lines and <laughs> and I knew his lines by heart. <laughs> when I went to the theater, you know, I didn't know that it took all of that to be an actor. So my dreams of being Dirty Dangerous was over. It was over before that because I'm originally from Mississippi, and, but I grew up here in New Orleans. And people say, why you talk like that? Girl, you talk some funny. So I didn't talk. So I knew I would never, you know, reach my goal of being the next dirt standard because I did not talk. And when I got older, I talked in a way. I just talked too much sometimes, as Wendy would tell you. And the next thing, you say Free Southern Theater, going to all of the rehearsals, going to plays. I saw so many plays uh, in white America. Does man help man? Uh, meeting people like Roscoe, Murray Levy, Big Daddy, Cynthia McPierce. Uh, Grace Brooks, I think was her name, Joe Perry, and Severn Darden. And going with, after rehearsal, going to a party at Severn Darden's house, apartment in the French Quarter on St. Peter Street, and going hearing Gil Moses play guitar and sing, then going downstairs and next door to Preservation Hall which I wind up working at a few years later. And like I say, and one, because I have never been to a live theater performance in my life, when they came to Desire area, I grew up in Desire. Uh, their office, when they moved to the Ninth Ward on Louisa Street, that was the building that used to be a grocery store in the front and the cleanest on the side. I lived across the Florida Avenue Canal on right off Louisa Street on Metropolitan. And when I went to the portrait reading, I was amazed at so many young people. And I remember, and I saw in the picture in the uh, FST book, Big Daddy holding the microphone to this young boy and I was amazed that these young kids were picking up on 
what was going on, and I thought that was great because when I was coming up, we didn't have anything like that. And so I just became involved in going to the production, knowing all of the people. Yeah. When I start work, you have a minute. Okay. Well, I'm gonna. We could talk about that later, but. Uh, one of the questions that Wendy asked is, when were you most afraid? Well, in Bugaloosa, Louisiana, there were two LCDC lawyers who had come to town, and the Free Southern Theater were appearing in Bugaloosa, and they wanted to go, but they didn't know how to get there. Well, I said, oh, I'll take you. Breaking the first rule of going to Bugaloosa call the deacons for defense and justice and let them know that you're coming. Well, I didn't. We got there okay, and Bob Hicks read me the riot act. But on the way home, they formed the line of cars. The deacons got in front. The car I was in with the LCDC lawyers were in back of Tom Dent. And when the deacons are driving, they do a hundred and they don't stop for nobody. Well, I don't know how Tom got lost, but because we were following Tom, we also wind up lost. And following us was the Klan. And the Klan ran into the side of the car that I was in. And I thought, oh my God, I'm not gonna make it this time. But we got away from them, but they caught up with us and hit us one more time in the back before we were able to get away from them. And that was my most frightening time, other than being a freedom rider and being involved in civil rights activities. That first question, what was the first thing you said, Wendy? When you think of Free Southern Theater, what comes to your mind? Um, growth. That's where I grew. Um, the other one, the next one. Uh, what was one of your most cha what challenging experiences? My most challenging experiences was um, learning to do the many jobs that are required to not only do theatrical work, but to do political work. You know, you have to really understand why you're doing what you're doing, where you have to go, and whether or not you have the courage, whether or not you have the, the um, internal strength to just do what you have to do, no matter how frightened you are, no matter how, you know, uh, 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 incompetent you might feel, you still have to try. And I think that for me uh, was what it was. Now the last one was being afraid. Well, we were on tour and uh, we had just visited the Ohio State University campus and we were on our way out, uh, headed back south. and. We were in Dayton, Ohio, I remember. And we were parked in this little area and pretty soon we had these cars following us. And I remember Jesse Morrell said, uh oh, we're in trouble. And I said, what kind, what kind of trouble? And then they started talking about the Ku Klux Klan. Now, I had been in Louisiana all my life. I never, you know, I didn't know that I was afraid of the Klan until Jesse said the Ku Klux Klan. And suddenly things start happening in my little body and I start going, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, like, what's going to happen now? Are we gonna, am I going to make it back to my children? All of those things start going through my head. But that was my most frightening experience with the FST because I usually, I don't have a lot of fear of many things. But what I want to say uh, here is that the Free Southern Theater 
was, in my opinion, one of the better things that New Orleans had to offer to black people in particular, and particularly poor black people, black people who had never seen a live play. I remember they used to come and say, when are you all gonna do another um, uh, movie, stage movie? You know, that's, that's how they knew it. They knew it as a, as a stage movie. And I remember the many times John and I would get into these humbugs about um, content of the plays that we did. You know, because, um, you know, I, I tried, I wanted to stay in the, in the, 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 the perimeters of the, of the neighborhood we were in. And John wanted to go past that. And so we used to get into a lot of, uh, John and I. But the point, the, the, the main point I want to say is that for here right now is to John and Chakula and everybody who, who gave to the Free Southern Theater, I'm grateful because you gave me an opportunity to have a career that I never thought I'd have. You gave me an opportunity to meet people that I never thought I'd meet. You gave me a chance to find out that I am an actress and a damn good one. And I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I guess when I think of FST and the things that I remember the most about FST, it's around fundraising. Um, when I was in New York, um, FST did um, the Friends of the FST. And I think Brock Peters was, and his wife Dee Dee. Um, there was a, a, a big benefit that was very successful and um, it was called Soul Food, Soul Food at the Wardorf, which was, really wasn't soul food, but they tried. <laughs> um, but um, it was my first um, introduction to fundraising, really. And um, I don't remember who um, ran the office, but I know you hired for that event a fundraiser, Hannah Weinstein, who was this feisty woman, shorter than me, um, who I think riled everybody, but knew exactly what she was doing and taught us so much. She was a real taskmaster, and we pulled off this really big event. I don't, I don't know. It must have been what three, four hundred people. Do you remember? Yeah, it was huge. <laughs> Um, lots of people came. I think Bill Cosby was the moderator. Um, Lena Horne was there. Muhammad Ali was there. I mean, it just, I think almost every black actor or actress who had some kind of consciousness was there. Um, and not just black. There were a lot of whites there, too. I can remember meeting Ava Gardner. Um, it was a really big event, and we worked very hard for it, and um, a lot of money was raised. Um, I have to say that John has played a really important part of my life um, in the sense, and you probably don't even think about this, <laughs> it was important to me. You, um, when I was living in New York, you asked me to... Um, if someone that you knew from New Orleans could stay at my house, my apartment, it was Roxy Wright. Um, Roxy came and stayed with me. She was working for Family Health Foundation at the time. Um, I had no intentions of moving to New Orleans. I had just finished on a college, and so she asked me, what was I doing? I said, well, I'm taking a few courses in public, um, in public health, but I don't really know what I'm going to do. I, I think I'm a continue school. She said, why don't you try the Tulane School of Public Health? There's this, um, there's this um, scholarship um, that's available, so why don't, in Family Health Foundation, why don't you apply for it? 
I said, I'll, I'll do that. To be perfectly honest, I had never even heard of Tulane. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I was from Jacksonville, Florida, a little girl. You know, I didn't know a lot. Um, so I did apply and did everything I was supposed to do and got the scholarship, um, and I was amazed. So I moved down here. I planned to be here for two years, and I think I met my husband, who has left the room, there at the Free Southern Theater at some event um, we were having there, and we've been married 38 years, so John, you're responsible. <laughs> But my, um, when I think about the theater, too, I never, for the longest, the theater and SNCC were one thing to me. I never thought of them as separate entities until um, much later, because everybody I knew with the theater was a part of SNCC. Um, so, but I had some wonderful times there and grew a lot, learned a lot. I'm like Frozine, I learned a lot of stuff. And I can... <clears throat> understand where you're coming from about being thrown in a situation. The same thing happened to me with SNCC. Um, they just give you a task and you're expected to do it. And, you know, by doing you learned. Um, I had a job of trying to find scholarships. when <laughs> I knew absolutely nothing about that. I knew absolutely nothing about grant writing. Um, was very bad at it and it stayed on my mind forever. I became a grant writer and <laughs> because I wanted to be good at something I had done so poorly when I was at SIDIC <laughs> and became a very successful, I should say, grant writer. When I think of the Free Southern Theater, I think of a lot of different things because when I came there in 69, it seems like a lot was, it was right after the Waldorf thing. It was still a big talk, you know, because it was a big thing. But um, I thought of it as, um, I thought about the, uh, the, I guess the community work they did, like they would go to um, the senior citizens' homes and do things for the seniors and different places like that. <laughs> there was also, um, of course, the, the plays. I don't know the Ninth Ward part so much, but I knew better, well, Miro Street, which was mainly the office, and uh, Dryad Street. Uh, so there was also the, uh, the performance part of it that um, I had watched and did little supportive work for. Uh, also, there was like a political part to it with the, um, the newspapers that were published. Uh, political newspapers, so I remember being like late while we were trying to get all of these newspapers out. Then of course there was also in Combo, the uh, uh, poetry magazine, so that was a big part of it too. So it was just a lot of different things going on, so for me it was like a, a lot of exposure because it was all new to me. And you know, so I was kind of, when I had time in all but mostly I didn't have time because it was a, a job where you just had so much to do and had to wear so many hats. And um, as we said before, you, you didn't get like a lot of, okay, this, here's a new job and let me train you for it. <laughs> you know? and so you were busy trying to figure out how, it, how to keep up and how to get it all done. So I, and, and it was also a coming of age experience for me. Well, John tells people he hired me, but he really didn't hire me. When I started working for the Free Southern Theater, I was really hired by uh, Bobby, Bobby Jones. John was uh, kind of like he continued to be on the road a lot, and so he was somewhere else. <laughs> so I would talk to him on the phone for like two weeks. He would call in almost every day and get his messages and things like that. And so I met him later on. But um, it had a, a big influence, and I think for most people, especially, uh, I would say, uh, maybe most people, but I know for New Orleanians that, you know, it was something that, that had a really big influence on, on our lives, you know, and for me, coming of age during that time. Um, so that was my experience with the theater, that I don't, I don't, um, fortunately, I guess, or unfortunately, I don't know, 
I don't have the experience of having a real fearful experience. Um, I was not really a part of the uh, civil rights movement. And I didn't really see that in New Orleans, as a matter of fact. I, I mean, you would hear about um, sit-ins at the Woolworths downtown or something like that, but it was not something that I participated. I didn't even go to like an integrated school where you had to, to fight that. So I didn't have the... I've heard lots of stories, though, from most people who were involved from um, the earlier days, but for personally, I didn't have that kind of experience. You still have about a minute, so do you want to talk any about the contemporary moment? Okay. Um, well, right now, I'm not, well, I guess John is still a part in a way, but um, after I retired, I came back to New Orleans and um, been in a supportive role. I've always felt like I was in a supportive role, you know, I was, because I thought of this as a theater company and I thought of myself as sort of a behind the scenes person. Well, I guess I still am that, you know. So, you know, he writes or he wrote or whatever, and I will read his stuff and give him, a, him an opinion on it. And sometimes he would uh, accept it, mostly not. <laughs> but um, so I, as then as now, you know, I think of myself as being in a support role and doing whatever, whatever I'm asked to do or whatever. Uh, there was a time when, um, you know, I would go into the office and try to help out a little too, but I never did a lot of that after retirement. Uh, so right now, that's where I am. Um, well, I thought, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, we thought we'd save this time for people to ask questions or share thoughts that we could then respond to. We have about a half an hour. Um, so unless someone has a burning desire of something else they'd like to say, we can move into that. All right. Um, so the mic is right there. And we know that these are some of the very important women of the Free Southern Theater, but not all of the women of the Free Southern Theater. So if you know stories of some of those other, other folks, please share them. Or if you have questions of these geniuses here, then go on and ask that. We'll wait. Sometimes it just takes a minute. Yeah, thank, thank you all. This is really great. Um, I want to go back to something that got raised at the morning panel a little bit about kind of when did consciousness about gender issues or did consciousness about gender issues come into the dynamics that you all experienced in a, in a theater and in a, in a movement that was radical in some ways, but it's what was said this morning that in other ways not as radical to do with gender. Well, earlier, John uh, raised the issue that uh, he and Gilbert were looking at my role as being one that um, was, quote, ma I guess, female-oriented, uh, make the coffee and write the, do the papers. But I did not have that experience, really, in my life, in growing up. Um, at my home, my father, uh, he, he was a provider. My mother was at home. But... Um, we worked as a team. We, um, my father was a cabinet maker in, in the evenings and on the weekends. Uh, we were an important part of an extended family on my, on both sides. My, my paternal, uh, grandparents lived, um, in New York for a while. We worked together. Um, we did house projects together, paint the house. Um, I used to work with my father uh, when he was in the basement working, uh, making cabinets, and I would do things to help him. So I didn't have, I always thought of uh, a family as a team, and that's the way I thought of as, 
FST and SNCC. And so whatever they thought just sort of rolled, rolled over me. I didn't pay it any attention. <laughs> I just did what I was going to do, what I thought I should do. What was needed at that time for uh, what we were doing in the civil rights movement. And um, so, and that was really the way I operated throughout the civil rights movement. Um, there are some things that uh, the guys that were doing, I, I just didn't, I didn't get involved. I just went on and did what I thought what I should be doing and what was necessitated. So, and the guys often sought my help uh, I f when I thought there was something that needed to be done, a project or something, um, I would f put the idea out of what we needed to do, and whoever responded, and it often was men, they wanted to work with me, and they wanted to uh, work in terms of ideas as well as skills and talents. Um, like I was working with the two other guys that were, we were putting on folk festivals. And so they had their roles, I had my role. So I really wasn't into um, being aware that much of men saying that we had to do certain things. Um, and that was just effective for me. Um, and that was, I think that was the way that a lot of women in the civil rights movement um, were. We had to work on multiple roles, and uh, whatever had to be done had to be done. Um, so that's, I think that that a lot of women that I was associated with, uh, like in the literacy project, um, COFO, Head Start, Liberty House, I was always working on multiple roles. Some of them might have been what um, women did, but a, a lot of it was just what needed to be done, and whoever was available, uh, need you know, was there, and they the men relied on us to do certain levels of things that needed to be done. I agree that. In New Orleans core, we were equal. There were more women in New Orleans core than men, but they didn't say, because you're a woman, you have to do this, you have to do that. We just did whatever had to be done. And there was no male part and female part that you had to do and if you saw something that needed to be done, you just did it. And you worked together as a team. And that's what we did in CORE. Well, I'd just, I just like to speak to this from a point of view of a, a woman with children. I had small children. And, you know, I was single. And in, in many instances, for me, it was difficult in the beginning because I... I didn't have babysitters and, and things like that, you know, so a lot of times I had to figure out how I was going to get me and my children to the theater, uh, keeping them up later than maybe they were, you know, I wanted them to be up so that I could do rehearsals and all of these kinds of things. In that respect, it, it, was, it was difficult. Um, but in terms of the actual actual work, the thing that I, I, I found at the community, at the uh, Free Southern Theater was that we were, we were all expected to just, like she said, do the work. Um, and, and sometimes you might find some chauvinistic thing happening on the part of an individual who I will not name, <laughs> but... <laughs> But, you know, we were able to work around that, and it didn't become a big deal. So for me, um, gender was sort of a, a, a situation, but not really. And in terms of the movement itself, I feel like women were oftentimes the headliners 
of the movement, but were not given the 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 top billing. Um, but in terms of the actual work, I think most of the actual work of the civil rights movement was done by women. Um, we didn't always like get recognition for it, but we were the we were the backbone. Women were the backbone of the civil rights movement. The men did all the traveling, but we did all the work. But getting back to with the civil rights, women being the backbone, and I think of the Freedom Ride when they continue, and Dr. King was asked to go on the ride, and he said he couldn't because he was on probation. Well, it was 18-year-old New Orleanian Julia Aaron that say, I'm on probation too. And I tell Julia now, you weren't on probation. She and Jerome had just got out of jail, and she was out on bail, but not probation. And when James Farmer was going back, was supposed to go back to New York because he had been away from the office so long, it was Doris Jean Castle. We called Jim Farmer Uncle Jim. And she said, you're going, Uncle Jim, aren't you? And she said that with tears in her eyes, and... He said, get my bag, and he got on the bus and went to Jackson. So women played a very important role in the civil rights movement, all the way back to you go to Irene Morgan, and people like that, you know, uh, Rosa Park, Fannie Lou Hamer, all strong women, Annie Devine, and there was no you can't do this because you're a woman. You did it anyway, because you were part of the movement. And you knew the importance of the, of the action. Right. And whether a man did it or not, it had to be done. And I think of when we were doing test rides after the ICC ruling, it was mainly women who went on the ride. In Poplarville, Mississippi, there were five of us females and one male uh, when the only time we had more males than females is in Macomb, Mississippi, where we had three males, but Jerome Smith was acting as the observer. Alice Thompson and myself were the females. George Raymond and Thomas Valentine were the other two males. And, you know, we took the beating just like the males did. And that was one time that I thought, my life had ended at 18 and a half. I think a lot of what happened is uh, the women went to the meetings. They did the work. Yes. They did a lot of the organizing work. They cooked. They yes. cleaned. They kept the babies. They made the babies and they kept them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, a lot of what happened and a lot of uh, absences throughout the years are attributable to that, that women were taking care of their babies and, and not being out on the front line, but making sure that the home front was safe and, and warm. And I, I can't overestimate the importance of that. I think we all have had times in our lives when we were dealing with women's work. And that's really how it was categorized. I know in, in my case, I was often the only woman in the later years of the writing workshop. It was a strange position to be in. We started out, there were a number of women, but they would eventually drop off, but I was the only silly one who kept writing and kept coming back. And so sometimes I'd find myself surrounded by these men, so I didn't really make that kind of distinction I just became, I guess, one of the writing guys. Um, I think that during the Civil Rights Movement, most black women felt that being discriminated against as a black person was much more, um, and was much harder and more important to fight against than being discriminated as a woman. We felt that being discriminated as African-American came first. Um, and I think, and it, I don't think that it 
black women didn't endorse the women's movement, it just wasn't as important to us. Because we've always done a lot of different things um, to take care of our families. Um, we've always had to go outside the box of what women do. Um, so it wasn't, I think, a big deal for, to black women, at least not to me and the uh, women I knew, as, it, as big a deal as it was for white women because we've always played a lot of different roles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I keep thinking about that uh, text. Shawnee, you're a scholar. Who edited all the blacks are men, all the women are white, but some of us are brave? That's not Barbara and Beverly Smith. No, that's Patricia Mandisa. Patricia Hull. Gloria T. Hull. Thank you. I scholars. Yeah, and so I No, wait. <laughs> yeah, I know there are people who read more than I do. Um and so it just makes me when I hear your comment, Aunt Jeannie, about uh, being needing to address the oppression of black people. Um, that's one of the things that comes to my mind is that we often think of oppression that impacts black people as oppression that is defined by masculinity or the impact of racism in ways that have consequences that our imaginations attach to masculinity. And so like I think about um, the Thompson sisters who went to Parchman Prison and um, how, what it meant for them to be in Parchment Prison um, and that th they were holding to their commitment to challenge white supremacy, not necessarily challenging patriarchy, you know? Um, so I'm just thinking that out loud. Johnny? Go, go to the um, microphone. So two things. Um, first, it was Gloria T. Hall, Patricia Bell Scott, and Barbara Smith who co-edited the anthology. Um, but then I guess the question that I have is really more about less of a gendered question, perhaps, and more of one that's just an intergenerational conversation so that when I'm looking at our contemporary moment and some of the issues that those of us who are grounded in the tradition of arts and activism are working to confront. We're looking at things like the explosion of the prison industrial complex. We're looking at um, the growing inequality along class lines and class stratification in this country in particular. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at the place that we occupy on the global stage and where in particular African Americans are going, what role we're going to play in challenging imperialism and militarism and the myth of American exceptionalism when we have a black man as the voice of the White House. So I guess as we're looking at all of these different issues, what I would like to know is not only your particular stance on what um, younger people should be doing and what leaders should be doing, but also um, I remember at the 50th anniversary of SNCC, Harry Belafonte came down and pointed out that the work of people who were involved in that movement is not behind y'all, that <laughs> you're still here and the work is still going on and you still remain very relevant in what we need to be shaping now. So I guess I'd also be interested in um, the current work that you're engaged in, particularly as it relates to those issues. case of rheumatoid arthritis, which limits, oh, okay. I thought I could, you know, get it out there, but anyway. Oh, okay, apologize. I, um, because of my, the severity of my arthritis, I don't get to do much. I have, uh, times when I can't do very anything at all. So I spend all my time on Facebook, you know, and that's where I get an opportunity to put my point of view out there, keep people focused on the need 
to stay engaged, informed, and uh, radical. Stay in the fight because the fight will not end until the fight is over and it will never be over until it ends, if that makes sense to anybody. You must, but in order to fight, you have to know who you're fighting, why you're fighting them, and how aligned and unified you can fight them. And that's where I focus my energies in terms of staying relevant to the movement. What I've been doing in the last couple of years is speaking to young people about the civil rights movement. Because as you know, it is not taught in schools, especially black schools. So I go around talking to students and working with Wendy because she's always got something going on where she needs somebody to come speak about civil rights and she calls Mama Doty and Mama Doty comes running. <laughs> but uh, I think it's very important to let young people know what we had to go through for them to be where they are today. Because the lot, I remember speaking at the Y, not at the Y, at at the Treme Center to a group of young Boy Scouts. They were aged seven to nine, and it was Jerome Smith, Matt Suarez, who we call Flucky, and myself who spoke there. And we were talking about riding the bus and having to sit behind a screen. And one little boy, I think he was seven years old, he say, what's a screen? So we had to describe to him what a screen was. And he looked at us and he say, no way. Because he's been used to sitting wherever he wants to sit on the bus. And I say, way. <laughs> and they just don't know. So I was talking about James Farmer and one kid, about nine years old, he say, the great debater. Well, I had never seen the movie. <laughs> and that's, that's what he know James Farmer as being the great debater from seeing a movie, a recent movie. And it's amazing that none of the kids knew anything about our civil rights leader. They didn't know about the civil rights movement and they didn't know about what we went through. And that's why I feel it's important to talk to young people, to let them know about the Freedom Rise, the sit-ins, about Free Southern Theater. Because, you know, I don't know how many of them today have gone to see a live, well, maybe they do, maybe they go to see the Madea thing. And, but other than that, you know, and I have a question for John. Because I always thought, when I went back in the days, when you did Waiting for Godot, why did you select that? Because I found it very hard trying to follow that. <laughs> and I, <laughs> now because, uh, who was in that? Uh, Murray Levy and Gil Moses and Jane Carmwell, yeah. And I never could figure that out and I say, why are they doing this production? You know, why don't they do something that I can relate to? That's the same thing I was talking about when I said John and I used to get into arguments about keeping the, the, keeping, keeping the productions that we were doing relevant to the area we were in and to the people of that area. You know, these were people, uh, you remember I made the remark one time, I said, you know, um, We've got to do some plays about things that happen in the ballroom because these are things that these people can, you know, that the people relate to. They knew, they knew about ballrooms. They didn't know about some of the things, uh, areas that we were speaking of at the time in our plays. And, and that's when, when you put the, the show 
the play in a ballroom, whatever the subject is, they can then relate because it's in a place that they know and they're willing to go to that place. Or in a church. Or in a, yeah, a church or a ballroom, you know, or, or, or at least make the surroundings theirs, some place they feel they own. Is that the same thing you were saying? Yeah, though? you know, I just didn't understand why, like you say, would they come into my community and do waiting for Godot and and I was trying to comprehend what was going on and the point they were trying to get over to me that I could not understand and when you come into an area like Zaire, it's a poor area but like it say, I didn't know I was poor until I went to high school because we always had a lot to eat. My dad from Mississippi, and that's another thing, when you did the plays in Holmes County, my dad is from Holmes County, and you mentioned going through Yazoo City. I got relatives there, and I was born in Yazoo County in Benton, Mississippi. Thank you. So, so I, I we wanted have, to... We have a bus that we need to load. Oh, okay. 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 Well, we're going to split those three minutes between these four people. Okay. Let me just say that um, there are representatives in the audience who are carrying on uh, the work that I was most recently involved with, it, and that was as founding director of the Center for Ethical Living and Social Justice Renewal. The new director is here. Would you stand up? Reverend Deanna Vandiver. And... The center is very much involved in um, fostering a lot of wonderful community relationships, and we would house and program volunteers from all over the country as a part of the recovery after Hurricane Katrina and educate them before we would send them out into our community. So we did a lot of anti-racism training. I um, have been spending the last 22 years at Georgia State University as Director of African American Student Services and Programs, where we have over 8,000 black students, um, really more than all the HBCUs combined in Georgia. In Georgia. Um, in, at least in Atlanta, I know for sure. And so uh, what I did in that um, position was continue to um, keep the civil rights movement um, in the forefront of uh, information passed on to those students, as well as to make sure that the students, um, the black students, the students of color, were retained and would graduate. And so that's, that's what I've been doing. And particularly also emphasizing the arts in um, the programming of activities at Georgia State. Okay. For 25 years, I um, administered and raised funds for a sickle cell program here in New Orleans. Um, I've been retired for the last couple of years. Um, I'm not doing anything um, official um, with the civil rights movement, um, though I was part of a book written um, a, by women um, in the civil rights movement, women from SNCC. Do you remember that? Hands on the freedom. Oh, hands on the freedom flow. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so if anybody's interested, it's called hands on the freedom plow. freedom plow. Um, but I, good. Thank you. Um, I spent a lot of time with my children and my family, and I try to instill within them some of the things that I've learned and. Um, I, I, I know I don't have a lot of time. I know that they have, I think today it's much harder because we had um, a very clear cut enemy that we were trying to overcome. And it's not so clear cut today. And so I think that the job today is much, much harder. And I spend time with my husband who's here, Bob Banks. <laughs> Uh, 
I've been a high school teacher um, for a long time. I've been retired a while, too. Uh, but as a high school teacher, and since retirement, I have been going back and doing some consulting work here and there, uh, working with high school kids. So um, I work with them in the ways that's needed, which is just so many ways, like you're talking about these enemies that are not so clear cut uh, in terms of um, support, the kind of extra support that they need in addition to the basic education stuff, as well as the education stuff and, you know, trying to trying to clear out some of the miseducation. Uh, but I think right now for the last couple of years especially, mostly I've been working with John. <laughs> so I've been back into my support role and helping him to do what he needs to do. I just want to say thank you again. <laughs> And I, I hope we take this as an opportunity to just remember that most of the work that we know about has more to the story and that we look to um, the women to learn more about how black liberation struggle has been sustained and been strategized and been out has, has, has had tactics that have continued to um, bring us closer to freedom. So um, I can't help, I think we should just stand up and hold hands and not let go. And then Stephanie can give us our instructions. Both hands. These are my aunties and my mamas. 